that there were so many witch trials and so they decided to elect only to make special people able to prosecute witch trials and that started to reduce the numbers. But to give you an idea, there's been lots of work done and I would encourage you to go online and look at the great work done by the University of Edinburgh. They have uh, tried to trace where they can the number of people that were convicted as witches. The difficulty was when things got out of hand, there were so many people, so many women, being accused and convicted of witches that there are no records for them. And therefore the numbers that they give are a very narrow estimation of how many people were killed. If I explain to you that in Salem, and also my day job as miscarriages of justice and one day I was walking along in uh, near the Norlock with my two wee dogs and uh, I, 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 it's just below the uh, Edinburgh castles where Princess Street Gardens and I was walking along I'm just about to tell you how the witches of Scotland started so I was walking along the there with the dogs and I, I was looking at, at, at statues and there were statues of, of, of men who had been involved in wars and statues of generals on horses. There's a statue of a dog called Bum the Dog. That's a literal name from Canada. Um, it's, it's twin to our great fire's body. And as I got to the top of Princess Street Gardens, I saw that there was a statue of a bear, a full-sized bear in Princess Street Gardens called Wojciech the Bear. And that was a bear that had helped out during the Second World War. It was a great bear, there's no doubt. But I looked around and I thought, where is the recognition of women in this country at all? And I looked up at the door of and I thought, hundreds of women died right there as witches. And there isn't so many women as a sign. There isn't, there isn't anything to say that happened. And it was at that point that I decided that I should try and combine my day job with my other interests and see whether or not I could raise enough interest in, this is so heartening today to see people turning out for enough interest in uh, seeing if we can get uh, uh, the, these women who died recognised the numbers that we are talking about broadly speaking of people that were accused of witchcraft in Scotland in comparison to Salem, the whole 19 there are approximately 3,800 people, uh, women in Scotland, 84% women, of people that were uh, uh, convicted as witches and the vast majority of whom uh, died. They were uh, strangled first and then they were burnt and they were burnt so that there was no record of them. So people didn't have a history of them and it's so telling that, that the only person that has a grave is Lilius at Toryburn and the reason for that was Although she'd been accused of a witch, she died during the period of time before her trial. She died in the month before her trial when she was being tortured, kept awake for hour after hour after hour and asked to confess. She confessed and she said she was a witch, but what she wouldn't do was name anyone else and that no doubt saved many other people from the same but before she could get to trial, and we'll hear more, much more about this perhaps from, from, from yourself, before she could get to trial, she, uh, she, she died in, in that period. And as a result of that, they didn't know where to bury her because she hadn't been convicted as a witch. 
so she still had the presumption of innocence. So they couldn't they couldn't do away with her in the same way, and therefore that's why we now have a, a place that we can go to where we say that she was, and that is so powerful when we're able to see that, and that's part of the reason that, that we're here, right here today at this particular area. people who in fact died before they ever got to trial because of because of torture so for those people they can't get a pardon because they were never convicted we want an apology a, a, a public apology for those people uh, to, to be made in parliament and the third and arguably most important thing is we want a public memorial so that people come to hear and know and understand about our past history if recent events have, have taught us anything um, a, 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 in relation to the, the, the Black Lives Matter campaign is that statues are important to people and that, that uh, uh, people take interest in these things and it's important I think that we have that visibility of what happened. So when I was asked by Kate to come along today and to uh, unveil this plaque, um, I absolutely jumped to the chance because it's it's the start of something which I think could be huge. Unfortunately, as Kate's already alluded to, you could put a trail all the way around Scotland and all the way around Europe. But I'm very, very glad to be here right at the very start and right at the very first of the three bronze plaques that are between here and Bonnyburn. And I'm now going to uh, I'm now going to unveil uh, the plan. Um, this is the bit where things don't work right. <laughs> <laughs> into the, the, women, the, the, the poor women who were um, tortured and killed. Back in 2016 when she did an amazing exhibition called Voices from Ashes and I think Voices from Ashes is a, an extremely apt um, name for to remember these women by. As you 
probably aware, Scotland had one of the highest rates of convictions and executions, four times the European average in fact, accounting for nearly 4,000 of the 60,000 Europe-wide, 16% of which were men. The most accurate figures, which the latest extensive research from Edinburgh University cites 3,837, of which 625 are unnamed. Sorry if I go over some of the facts that you already mentioned. 32 were from Kouris and 19 from Torryburn. But who were the women? They were not as popular culture likes to embrace midwives or healers, who actually accounted to around 4% of the total. The majority, 64%, were middle class, often over 40, widowed or un unmarried, 29% were the poorest strata and 6% actually lairds or nobility. Witches were also seen as hereditary and so often members of the same family would be, would be unlucky enough to be accused together and indeed in subsequent generations. It would seem that by definition a witch could be anyone. In its strictest sense, a witch was an enemy of God, a maleficent devil worshipper, and ultimately an enemy of the state. The weaker sex, also less able to resist the temptations of the devil. As my grand used to say, there would be no bad women if there were no bad men. <laughs> no, the other way round, sorry. No bad men if there would be no bad women. So that carries on to present day. It's still in our culture as we speak. With the Reformation, civil war looming, or at large, and increased jurisdictional powers given by the Scottish state to the localised Kirk sessions of the Church of Scotland, the male-dominated parish elite were to see their Calvinistic, godly discipline meted out with fervour and ruthlessness. This was not a direct money-making endeavour, but a way to keep total control of the communities, and largely illiterate communities would have had a genuine fear of witches based on the words and interpretations of the Bible by their local revered minister. Indeed, the main profiteers were low levels of servants, jailers, executioners and witch prickers. No doubt the publication of demonology by James VI in 1597, which is also the year the first part of the palace was built, would have set a precedent for rule makers. One can say here that Catholic practices, the practice of carrying faith charms, folklore, fairies and many beliefs which had previously brought comfort and had been part of Scottish culture for centuries became the focus of the new system. It's also created a pressure cooking environment of fear, intimidation and power politics in which local quarries over possessions and land and other aspects of everyday life Came and flamed. As a resident of this beautiful borough, I can attest that this still happens on some level. The trials came in waves of hysteria and were mostly held in the courts. Evidence was extracted mainly by sleep deprivation, causing hallucinations and lurid confessions, although these were likely contrived by the accusers due to their formulaic nature, especially in the High Court of Edinburgh. The Reverend Alan Logan, as we mentioned before, of Torryburn, was a master witch hunter, famed throughout Scotland for his witch hunting skills, and as we know, was successful in his condemnation of Lilius Murray. After their torments, they were usually strangled and burned at the stake, although sometimes burned alive or hung. Notably, in the trial of Catherine Sands and her four accomplices, Isabel Inglis, Agnes Hendries and John at Hendries in 1675. The accusations were so formulaic and stereotypical, i.e. carnal copulation with the devil, the attendance at Sabbaths held in deserted churches, which was actually the West Kirk up, up above Curus, giving themselves over from the top of the head to the toes of their feet and receiving the mark of the devil. They apparently all made these confessions, which beggars belief and we can relate these detailed confessions to the case of Lily and Sadie later. I think that there was a certain ticking of boxes. Another notable case, I won't go on too long, I've just got a little bit more. <laughs> Another notable case.
case that is a that is a with a written account was of Helen Elliot in 1684 from Kouris and written by a person of great honesty and sincerity, <coughs> Alexander Colville. He writes that the poor woman had to be carried to her place of execution in a chair by four men as she had broken her legs and belly, having been incarcerated in the steeple of Kouris, which in this case would have actually been up at the Abbey, as at that time the steeple wasn't on the townhouse. So she, she had tried to escape and fallen and broken her legs and her body. Um, the, she had had her legs secured in stocks by her jailers, but somehow the devil had managed to release her and throw her from the tower, so her jailers said. More likely is that her jailers were negligent and had to make up a story to protect themselves. Poor terrified Helen, broken and burned. Finally, these are just but a couple of cases, and I've not gone into detail about some of the gruesome and inventive tortures these women endured, even although this is why we are here. Too often you hear titillating misinformation and glamorising of the gory details of their suffering in the name of entertainment and money making. I think it's important for the wider public to remember these victims as real people and not immaterial to our own lives. They were mothers, daughters, cousins, sisters and living a hard life in a tumultuous early modern Scotland. Female inequality and persecution continues around the world to this day and in some way the recognition of these historical injustices and the victims themselves can shine a light for all women. May the voices from ashes be heard. Studies Officer at Carnegie Library Museum in Dunfermline, the creator of the Facebook campaign group Remembering the Accused Witches of Scotland. I'd like Sarah to say a few words and pose an event, but tell them about the campaign. Sarah, okay. if you would. Thank okay. you. First of all, I have gifts to give to oh. Claire. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> discs. There are three of these discs and we've got some mini discs made so Claire's got those to remember the occasion by. They're absolutely beautiful um, but we couldn't get enough made to, to sell them today. So um, what I'd like to say is thank you very much for coming. Remember to social distance because we have had some complaints so it's up to you as individuals to social distance please. Um, remember to sign this the track and trace but also please please join our campaign we are absolutely on the verge of making a big thing here the facebook is growing every day we're getting new members every day that's remembering the accused witches of scotland we are becoming a constitutive body and the idea is that this is just the first of these events and we want to spread them across scotland and eventually have a national memorial hopefully somewhere in this district um, please do sign up please do contribute if you want to join and be a valued member and actually be able to contribute we have meetings once a month on zoom properly socially distanced um, and so you can give your opinions give your ideas and help us to to make this project actually work Thank you very much for coming along today and let's get this thing going. There is a conference, I nearly forgot, there is a virtual conference on the 8th of November and I'm looking for contributors so please come and see me at the end if you would like to contribute. I'm going to get Lindsay to record what she said because so few people heard it and we'll get that onto the conference and as well as Claire hopefully. That would be great. Thank you very much for coming today.